High Adventure. Tonight we present The Gun by Anthony Robbins. The gun was an M16A1 rifle manufactured in the United States in 1967. 0.22 caliber, gas-operated, magazine-fed, capable of semi-automatic and fully automatic fire. It was a meter in length and weighed just under three kilograms. It was shipped out to Vietnam early in 1968, and before returning four years later, it had killed 23 North Vietnamese soldiers, 11 Viet Cong guerrillas, two peasant farmers, three women, and a six-month-old baby. In 1973, the gun was stolen, and over the next seven years, it added a petrol pump attendant, a liquor store owner, and two New York policemen to its list of victims. In 1981, it resurfaced in Northern Ireland. Then came the wealthy businessman, the UDA man, and an IRA informant. When its owner died of a heart attack a year later, his wife sold it to a relative to pay for the funeral. The relative, Ron Finnegan, occasionally dabbled on the black market, operating from a sweet shop in Manchester. For three years, the gun gathered dust on his storeroom shelf. It lay muzzle up between a case of chocolate bars and a case of Russian-made hand grenades. That was until Ron received a check in the post for £250. It was accompanied by a note with the words, Payment as agreed. And below that, a name and address, John Green, Yew Tree House near Fordingham, Devon. The name was false, but the address was genuine enough. Someone at Yew Tree House intended adding another four names to the gun's already impressive death toll. Gunston, superbikes at ball door. You scratch hard round the bend, turn it on to 270 Ks and you're out front, untouchable. You're close to the things men rate great, like Gunston Toasted. Gunston cigarettes are made from the best tobaccos a man can get for that rich, rewarding, toasted taste. Get closer to flavor with Gunston Toasted. Van Tommy Dell, the Oekamer Sigma. Met die strelende stem van C.S. Reiniger. Op zijn nietste langspiller, Macy. Macy, is je leven zonder mij ook alleen. Als jij op sproeikjes verliefd was, zal jij bijna feest voor C.S. Reinikers en nieuwe Macy. Geen slechts 9 rand 49 exclusief bij alle Oekamer platen toen dan kan land. Yew Tree House was owned and run by the research department of Lincoln Electronics. Once the large rambling residence of a country squire, it had now been converted into the headquarters of a top research team. Four men and one woman, who together were responsible for the company's phenomenally successful line of microcomputers. After a fortnight's holiday, they began to return, one by one, to the country retreat. Steve? You were around? Yes, in the lounge. Come on in, Dave. Stephen Hodgson was the project leader. Still a young man of 35, but going prematurely bald. And David Graham was an electronics expert. With his leather clothes and hair dyed bright green, he epitomized the unconventional approach that made Lincoln Computers market leaders. When did you arrive? Uh, a couple of hours ago. I wasn't expecting anyone else until tomorrow. <laughs> I was visiting a friend in Exeter, so I decided, what the hell, I'd arrive early for a change. Well, I'm glad you did. There's a whole heap of supplies to buy in the village. You can give me a hand. It's about time head office sent us some domestic help. We could do with some decent cooking around here. <laughs> yes, I did ask him about that, but, uh, well, there's too big a security risk. Oh. The less people who know what we are working on, the better. Which reminds me, where are your circuit charts? 
In the boot of the car. I've made a few improvements to the general design. Yeah, good. Now, if you give it to me, I'll lock it up in the safe before we go out. Right, eh? There was another break-in at head office last week. We just can't afford to take any risks. Ron Finnegan set about packing the gun. First, he wrapped it up in a recent copy of the Manchester Evening News. Emptying a carton of extra-strong mints, he placed the bundle inside. And before closing the lid, he scribbled out a note to the new owner. Finally, the carton was closed and wrapped in plain brown paper and tied with a length of string. On the way back from depositing the cheque in his private building society account, he stopped off at the post office. The postal charges came to three pounds. All told, not a bad day's work. Business was looking up. The first to arrive at Yew Tree House the following morning was Janet Gordon. She joined Lincoln Electronics shortly after gaining an engineering degree at Bristol. In what's generally considered a man's world, she excelled. So much so that at the age of 25, she was already one of the company's most prized employees. Hi. Enjoy your holiday? Lovely. I started off in New York, then California, where I got this tan... Then a coach trip right across the southern states, ending up in Miami. Mm. I enjoyed every minute of it. Well, you're all set for some intensive work, I hope. You bet. The gun arrived at the Royal Mail Central Sorting Depot in London early that morning, having spent an uncomfortable night in the mail car of the overnight train from Manchester. Hello. Hi, Damon. Have you just arrived? Yeah. How was the trip down? All right. Steve and Dave are in the kitchen making a bite to eat. You hungry? No. Some tea? Uh, no, thanks. Did you sort out the problem with the operating system? <sighs> sure. Good. We should be all set to go then. Mm -hmm. Steve will be pleased. That's right. Well, sit down. No, I'm going to put my bags away. Fine. But how about a smile, Damon? How's this? <laughs> Much better. Damon Harris was the youngest member of the team and a man of few words. Unlike all the others, he had no formal education, having left school at 16, because he couldn't stand his classmates. His talents were spotted by Lincoln Electronics when he wrote his first computer game for one of their earlier computers. The game spent months on the top of the bestsellers list and was described by the micro press as revolutionary, the shape of things to come. In fact, it was so revolutionary that not even the designers of the computer could work out how it worked. So to satisfy their curiosity, they decided to hire the youngster. Four years later, he was now a firmly entrenched member of their top research team. Half an hour later, the last member of the team arrived. Craig Williams was one of the few Welshmen without a sense of humour. He'd been with Lincoln Research as head programmer since its inception. That he'd been overlooked as project leader in favour of Stephen Hodgson was a constant irritation to him. Craig was older, more experienced, and better qualified than Steve. All that kept him back was his moody disposition and the fact that none of the others liked him. He arrived in an even worse mood than usual. What do you mean by my responsibilities to the others? I haven't any. Now, look, Craig, I don't want to argue with you again. I clearly stated before we took this holiday that everyone was to get all their own department sorted out before coming back. Now, the others have done that, but now you tell me that you still haven't finished. Well, that's fine for you. Would you ever do but throw your weight about? Now, look, I'm not going into all that again. You know the answer as well as I do. Don't make me laugh. Now, that would be downright impossible, wouldn't it? Okay, Steve. Tell me what you did over the past two weeks. You really want to know? Sure. All right. I made out a progress report to head office. In it, I said that they can expect results at the end of this month. And that's only five days away. I'll be ready by then. You better be. And after you made your report, what did you do then? That's none of your business. That's right. And what I did over the past two weeks is none of your business either. But I'll tell you anyway. I worked 16 hours a day non-stop. I'm glad to hear it. I bet you are. And you'll probably get all the credits as well. The parcel addressed to Yew Tree House was ready to embark on the 115 to Penzance. 
It lay on the platform among all the other westbound posts, waiting for the porter to finish his cup of tea. When he arrived, the porter's mind was more on which horse to pick in the fourth race at Doncaster than on the task in hand. He impatiently hurled the parcel into the compartment, neglecting to notice the handle with care warning. The resulting impact dislodged the safety catch on the rifle, and Ron's scribbled note slid in between pages six and seven of the Manchester Evening News, nestling up to the latest stock share prices. Over the past year, Lincoln Electronics share value had almost doubled, and this was in stark contrast to their competitors. In particular, the British subsidiary of the Fairchild Corporation, whose latest computer had recently been branded as outmoded and an insult to the intelligence. Marcus Fairchild, the founder of the company, knew that something had to be done by fair means or foul, and he picked the latter option. Sitting behind his monstrous oak desk in a monolithic office block in New York, he waited for the phone to ring. Yeah? That's the call I've been waiting for, Maureen. Put it right through, will you? Hello? Speaking. How are you? Good. Are we going ahead as planned? Great. Have the others arrived yet? Yeah. Fine. Right, here's my end of the bargain. When you've done the job, phone 80678 in Exeter. That's right. There'll be a man waiting to pick you up at the house and take you to Heathrow. He has a new passport and a completely new set of documents for you. By the time anyone cottons on, you'll be out of the country. A fully-fledged U.S. citizen. Now for the money. I've opened an account in your new name, and as soon as I receive the plans, it'll be a million dollars to the good. Once we've gone into production, your commission will be 2% of all sales. Yeah, I know 2% doesn't sound like much, but I'm talking about millions here. How does that sound? Great. All settled. You won't regret it. I'm looking forward to meeting you again. When do you think it'll be? The, the job, I mean. Eh, tomorrow. Yeah. Excellent. The sooner the better. And goodbye to you. Maureen, I'm taking the rest of the day off. I know I've only just arrived, but what the heck? I'm going for a well-deserved round of golf. If any of the shareholders phone, tell them I'm in a meeting that's going to send Fairchild stock zooming. The Fordingham Post Office received the plain wrapped parcel late that afternoon. It was shelved for the night, all set for delivery the following day. At Yew Tree House, the newly arrived occupants slept well, except one who lay awake till the early hours deep in thought. Not about last-minute doubts or whether to go through with it or not, but about how, when, and where. One million dollars down and two percent of sales. Now that was better than a lifetime with Lincoln Electronics. Oer mag vandaag a sunshine dear dag. Sunshine dear, heerlijke smaak, plus die sonskyn vitamin wat ons lichaam in nodig het. O, pak het en kyk wat daar op jou vaag, a vrolike laagdag, a sonskyn of reerdag, a dag vol van smaak, a lewe vol maak, ja. Sunshine dear, die margarine met sonskyn vitamin, kyk uit vir die groot rooi dier. Great American taste of world famous L and M filter cigarettes from Liggett and Myers. L and M, the rich tasting, flavor packed American. L and M, now made in your country. L and M filters in the red and white pack. Dave. Hi, Janet. Eating alone? The others have eaten already. 
But it's only eight o'clock. I think it's a new, unwritten law. What do you mean? Well, you must have felt it. The atmosphere. Like something's going to explode. Oh, you mean Steve and Craig. But it's always like this. They'll get over it. Oh, I'm not so sure this time. You weren't here earlier. Why? What happened? Nothing. That's just it. Not a word was spoken. Oh, dear. <laughs> Craig and Steve just scowled at each other. And you know how quiet Damon is. Mm. <laughs> it was like being at a funeral. Thank heavens you're around to cheer me up. <laughs> what is it this time? Oh, same as usual, I'd say. Craig's resentment and Steve's insecurity. It's bloody ridiculous when you consider what the team's achieved since we've been together. You'd think they'd have grown up by now. Well, I don't know about you, but I think we'd all do a lot better without Craig. Steve, I can get along with, but Craig... Well, it's impossible to have a conversation without him snapping at you. I know, but he's good at his job. That's just the problem. He's the best. And Steve knows it. Why can't they behave like normal human beings? Like us two, for example. <laughs> you? <laughs> normal? With green hair and earrings? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm normal. All I want is to enjoy myself. Fun, excitement. Oh, and money. I've always had this obsessive desire to be a millionaire by my 30th birthday. Oh. I've only got a year left, you know. <laughs> Pass the sugar, please. Um, Craig. Are you talking to me, sir? Yes. Well, all right, get on with it then. I'm busy, or haven't you noticed? I, um, uh, I'd like to apologize. Don't tell lies. Steve, you don't want to apologize. You're just trying to get me to cooperate like a good little boy. Well, if that's the way you want to look at it, that's up to you. But I am sorry. I, I had no right to come down on you the way I did. It's a bit late for all this now, isn't it? The damage is done. What damage? Between you and me. There was very little between us in the first place. I don't like you, Craig. You're the most bitter and twisted person I've ever met. But it just so happens that we've both got our jobs to do. All I really care about is the success of this project. The feeling is entirely mutual, Steve. I hate you, too. I'm glad about that. Now, all I want from you is a short verbal report on the progress of the interpreter. Why didn't you just ask me that in the first place, then? Here we are. Floor charts are complete. Thank you. And these subroutines, complete and tested. Mm -hmm. And these fully explanatory notes on each. There may be a few spelling mistakes, but you can never tell. And here, a complete program listing, fully documented. So what's the problem? Well, there's a few bugs to be ironed out. Simple process of going through everything with a fine-tooth comb... In other words, bloody time-consuming. Yeah, but you don't have to be 100% at this stage. We can test it later. All I'm asking is to make sure that there's nothing wrong with the fundamental design of the interpreter, as long as it works. Of course it will work. It's just a few bugs, that's all. Great. At last, everything's coming together. <laughs> you see, Craig, it wasn't so difficult. Thanks. I don't need your thanks, Steve. I'm just doing my job, remember? Can I come in, David? Yeah. Uh, Steve asked me to tell you. Three o'clock in the lounge. What for? A meeting. I see. Mind if I sit down? If you like. Got your head stuck in a book again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's it about? War. War? That's right. American Armed Forces. I didn't know you were into war, Damon. I've got hundreds of war books at home. Gives me ideas. Ideas? For what? Computer games. Are you still writing them? When I get the chance. Do you like working here? It's all right. I mean, as a team. Well, I prefer being alone. That's what I figured. When you're not working, you're always in here, reading. You never mix. I don't mean to pry, Damon, but why are you like that? Does it matter? Yes, I think so. Some folks are different, I suppose. And you're different? Yeah. Because you're from the north and we're all from the south? Maybe. Is it your education? Maybe. Shyness? Yeah, maybe. Well, it must be something. I suppose it must. Are you happy? So-so. Do you have ambitions? One. <laughs> and what's that? To live alone on a South Sea island. Really? Why all the questions? Well, I thought that after two years of virtual silence, we might at least become friends. Oh, I see. But somehow I don't think it's going to work. No, I don't think it will. Oh, well, it's been nice chatting to you, Damon. Uh, don't forget Steve's meeting at three. I won't. The bright red van crawled up the road leading to Yew Tree House. 
It was the last call on the postman's daily round. The plain-wrapped parcel wasn't the only post for Yew Tree House that day. There were five letters and three other parcels of various shapes and sizes. The postman rang the doorbell. Janet was in the kitchen making a bite of lunch. She went through into the hall, opened the front door, and relieved the weary man of his burden. Which you want to make? Oh, the table would do. Yeah. That's right. Oh, here's something for your trouble. Why, thank you, ma'am. Steve? Mm hmm? The post's arrived. I'll be right down. It was just after 8 a.m. in New York, and Marcus Fairchild felt strong, refreshed, and confident after his round of golf the previous day. He'd gone 18 holes with his accountant, and today he was ready to make his move on Wall Street. He phoned his stockbroker. Hi, Billy. Fine, fine. Yeah, she's fine, too. Listen, what price have you got on Fairchild's stock? Twelve fifty. Hell, I didn't know it had sunk that low. Plenty of sellers and no buyers, eh? Well, that's just fine, just fine. Sure, I'm in the market. <laughs> no, I'm perfectly sane. Here's what I want. Start buying 5000 at a time. That way it won't be noticeable. Phone me back when you've got a million's worth. You bet. But keep it to yourself for the time being. Sure. In another six months, we'll be back to $40 a share. I was taking my life. There's always something exciting about the post, don't you think? Well, I always dread it. Oh, not me. Presents, letters from long-lost friends, Valentine cards... All the things we look forward to always seem to arrive in the mail. <laughs> you know something, Janet? You're an incurable romantic. Mm, I know I am. Mm. <laughs> well, is there anything for me? No, it doesn't look like it. Uh, there's a letter for Damon. Oh, that'll be from his mother, probably. Uh, well, there's two for Dave. Oh, that'll be record catalogues. I don't know. Must be something important. He's been looking out for the post all morning. What's that? Uh, this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, nothing that'll interest you. It's a phone bill. Oh. Mm. <laughs> there's one for me. Uh, from head office, by the looks of it. Well, what about the parcels? Well, uh, let's see. Equipment. More equipment. Oh. Wait a minute. What's this? <laughs> Will you look at that? Champagne. Champagne? Yeah. Oh, here's a card. Well, what does it say? Um, to the best in the business, only to be drunk when the chip comes in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All our love, everybody at Lincoln Electronics. Oh, sweet. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> well, mind you, I can't imagine Craig swilling down champagne, can you? It does seem to stretch the imagination a bit far. Hmm. What's that last one? Uh, let's see. It's uh, that's to John Green. I don't have to go back. Ah, oh, just leave it there, and the next person who goes into the village can take it with them. Right. Well, that's it. Nothing for you, I'm afraid. So what? <laughs> I'll make do with a bottle of champagne when this is all over. Stephen Hodgson's arranged meeting lasted an hour and a half. To his surprise and delight, it went well, despite Craig's caustic remarks and Damon's customary silence. As far as Steve was concerned, the project had come to a successful end. Lincoln Model 10 was well and truly launched. Well, does anyone want to add anything before I crack open the champagne? <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. Really. Okay. All right, then. Here you go. Well, get the glasses ready. There we go. Watch oh, it. It's going all over the oh. carpet. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. You're going to have some, Craig? Bury the hatchet. I'd prefer a beer. Oh, you can't make a toast with a beer mug. Well, since you put it like that. Uh, what about you, Damon? Thanks. Right. Everybody ready? Mm -hmm. Steve, you do the honors. All right. <clears throat> Uh, well, to the Lincoln Model 10, and to us. To the Lincoln, Lincoln Model 10, 10 and to us. us. All together now. Oh, for we are jolly good fellows, for we are jolly good fellows, for we are jolly good fellows. While four sat drinking and talking in the lounge, a fifth left the room unnoticed and entered the kitchen. A pair of sweaty hands were rinsed under the sink and dried on a dishcloth. Firm and steady footsteps retraced the path into the hall and stopped at the table where the parcel lay waiting. The knotted string was undone, the plain brown paper ripped off, and the carton tucked under one arm. Then the feet took over, moving stealthily back into the lounge, 
the door closing behind them. I heard it down the grapevine that we're all in for a hefty pay rise next month. Oh. I can't be certain, but I had it on good authority. It's round about bloody time as well, isn't it? Dear, I'll never make my million at the present rate. <laughs> Anyone for a refill? Uh, <laughs> not quite Newport best, but I, I'll have another. Damon, do you want some more? No. No, don't think so. Steve, I know you will. What a question. <laughs> you all right there, Damon? <clears throat> hey, I didn't know you were so bloody mad on extra strong mints. A whole carton full of them. <laughs> I'm not. This is for you. What is it? Stand back and I'll show you. Hey, guys, I think you'd better take a look at this. This is an M16A1 automatic rifle. And it's fully loaded. I know how to use it. Damn. Shut up. What? Damon. Shut no. up. Don't you understand? You're all going to die. Now. Hello, da, from Tommy Dell, the Urkamer Sigmund. Met die strelende stem van C.S. Reinecke. Op zijn nietste langspiller, Macy. Macy is je leven, zonder mij ook alleen. Als jij op sproeikjes verliefd was, zal jij bijna feest voor C.S. Reinecke's nieuwe Macy. Geen slechts 9 rand 49 exclusief bij alle OK platen toen dan kan land. Die ultra lichte sigaret van die 80s is nu beschikbaar in 30s. Benson en Hedges, vervaardigers van Zuid-Afrika's voorverkoper en lichte sigaretten, bied jou nu Benson en Hedges Ultra Mild 30s. Je kan nu oorslaan na ultra zachtheid zonder om smaakprijs te geven met Benson en Hedges Ultra Mild 30s. It was three long years since the gun had been held this way, the stock resting in a tight palm and a taut finger wrapped around the trigger. Three long years of standing in up between a case of chocolate bars and a crate of Russian-made hand grenades. Three long years in a dusty, damp storeroom. What the Damon, hell are you doing? Damon Harris pulled the trigger and the gun blew up in his face. Shards of burning metal searing his cheeks, piercing his eyes, digging deep into his chest. He slumped to the floor, crumpling the carton and scattering the pages of the Manchester Evening News, which eventually settled down beside him, open at pages six and seven, the stock market report. Lincoln Electronics hitting new highs, the Fairchild Corporation plummeting to new lows, and Ron Finnegan's scribbled note fluttered to the floor. Damon! Oh. Damon! You're wasting your time, Steve. He's dead. <laughs> Why would he do it? I don't know. Something to do with being alone on a South Sea island, I expect. <laughs> Craig? Something wrong? I just found this. I don't believe it, Craig. You're laughing. It's a note from whoever he got the gun from. A bit rusty, it says. It needs a damn good clean. Hope it works. High Adventure is produced by Henry Duffenthal.